Extract from Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans Life of Demetrius the Besieger By a rapid advance, he rescued Halicarnassus from Ptolemy, who was besieging it. The glory which this act obtained them inspired both the father and son with a wonderful desire for freeing Greece, which Cassander and Ptolemy had everywhere reduced to slavery. No nobler or juster war was undertaken by any of the kings. The wealth they had gained while humbling with Greek assistance, the barbarians being thus employed, for honor's sake and good repute in helping the Greeks. When the resolution was taken to begin their attempt with Athens, one of his friends told Antigonus, if they captured Athens, they must keep it safe in their own hands, as by this gangway they might step out from their ships into Greece when they pleased. But Antigonus would not hear of it. He did not want a better or a steadier gangway than people's good will, and from Athens, the beacon of the world, the news of their conduct would soon be handed on to all the world's inhabitants. So Demetrius, with a sum of five thousand talents, and a fleet of two hundred and fifty ships, set sail for Athens, where Demetrius the Falarian was governing the city for Cassander, with a garrison lodged in the port of Munichia. By good fortune and skilful management, he appeared before Piraeus on the twenty-sixth of Thargelion, before anything had been heard of him. Indeed, when his ships were seen, they were taken for Ptolemies, and preparations were commenced for receiving them, till at last the generals, discovering their mistake, hurried down, and all was alarm and confusion, and attempts to push forward preparations to oppose the landing of this hostile force. For Demetrius, having found the entrances of the port undefended, stood in directly, and was by this time safely inside, before the eyes of everybody, and made signals from his ship, requesting a peaceable hearing. And on leave being given, he caused a herald with a loud voice to make proclamation that he was come thither by the command of the Father, with no other design than what he prayed the gods to prosper with success, to give the Athenians their liberty, to expel the garrison, and to restore the ancient laws and constitution of the country. The people, hearing this, at once threw down their shields, and, clapping their hands with loud acclamations, entreated Demetrius to land, calling him their deliverer and benefactor. And the Falarian and his party, who saw that there was nothing for it but to receive the conqueror, whether he should perform his promises or not, sent however messengers to beg for his protection, to whom Demetrius gave a kind reception, and sent back with them Aristodemus of Miletus, one of his father's friends. The Falarian, under the change of government, was more afraid of his fellow citizens than of the enemy, but Demetrius took precautions for him, and out of respect for his reputation and character, sent him with a safe conduct to Thebes, whither he desired to go. For himself, he declared he would not, in spite of all his curiosity, put his foot in the city till he had completed its deliverance by driving out the garrison. So, blockading Munichia with a palisade and trench, he sailed off to attack Megara, where also there was one of Cassander's garrisons. But, hearing that Cratisipolis, the wife of Alexander, son of Polisperchon, who was famous for her beauty, was well disposed to see him. He left his troops near Megara, and set out with a few light-armed attendants for Patrai, where she was now staying. And quitting these also, he pitched his tent apart from everybody, that the woman might pay her visit without being seen. This some of the enemy perceived, and suddenly attacked him, and in his alarm he was obliged to disguise himself in a shabby cloak and run for it, narrowly escaping the shame of being made a prisoner in reward for his foolish passion. And as it was, his tent and money were taken. Megara, however, surrendered, and would have been pillaged by the soldiers, but for the urgent intercession of the Athenians. The garrison was driven out, and the city restored to independence. While he was occupied in this, he remembered that Stilpo, the philosopher, 
famous for his choice of a life of tranquility, was residing here. He therefore sent for him, and begged to know whether anything belonging to him had been taken. No, replied Stulpo, I have not met with any one to take away knowledge. Pretty nearly all the servants in the city had been stolen away, and so, when Demetrius, renewing his courtesies to Stilpo, on taking leave of him, said, I leave your city, Stilpo, a city of free men. Certainly, replied Stilpo, there is not one serving man left among us all. Returning from Megara, he sat down before the citadel of Munichia, which in a few days he took by assault, and caused the fortifications to be demolished. And thus, having accomplished his design, upon the request and invitation of the Athenians, he made his entrance into the upper city, where, causing the people to be summoned, he publicly announced to them that their ancient constitution was restored, and that they should receive from his father Antigonus a present of one hundred and fifty thousand measures of wheat, and such a supply of timber as would enable them to build a hundred galleys. In this manner did the Athenians recover their popular institutions. After the space of fifteen years from the time of the war of Lamia and the battle before Cranon, during which interval of time the government had been administered nominally as an oligarchy, but really by a single man, Demetrius the Falerian being so powerful. But the excessive honours which the Athenians bestowed for these noble and generous acts upon Demetrius created offence and disgust. The Athenians were the first who gave Antigonus and Demetrius the title of kings, which hitherto they had made it a point of piety to decline, as the one remaining royal honour still reserved for the lineal descendants of Philip and Alexander, in which none but they could venture to participate. Another name which they received from no people but the Athenians was that of the tutelar deities and deliverers, and to enhance this flattery, by a common vote it was decreed to change the style of the city, and not to have the years named any longer from the annual Archon, a priest of the two tutelary divinities, who was to be yearly chosen, was to have this honour, and all public acts and instruments were to bear their date by his name. They decreed also that the figures of Antigonus and Demetrius should be woven with those of the gods into the pattern of the great robe. They consecrated the spot where Demetrius had first alighted from his chariot and built an altar there with the name of the Altar of the Descent of Demetrius. They created two new tribes, calling them after the names of these princes, the Antigonid and the Demetriad, and to the council, which consisted of five hundred persons, fifty being chosen out of every tribe, they added one hundred more to represent these new tribes. But the wildest proposal was one made by Stratocles, the great inventor of all these ingenious and exquisite compliments, enacting that the members of any deputation that the city should send to Demetrius or Antigonus should have the same title as those sent to Delphi or Olympia for the performance of the national sacrifices in behalf of the state at the great Greek festivals. This Stratocles was, in all respects, an audacious and abandoned character, and seemed to have made it his object to copy, by his buffoonery and impertinence, Cleon's old familiarity with the people. His mistress, Philakion, one day bringing him a dish of brains and neckbones for his dinner, Oh, said he, I am to dine upon the things which we statesmen play at ball with. At another time, when the Athenians received their naval defeat near Amorgos, he hastened home before the news could reach the city, and having a chaplet on his head, came riding through the Caramacus, announcing that they had won a victory, and moved a vote for thanksgivings to the gods, and a distribution of meat among the people in their tribes. Presently after came those who brought home the wrecks from the battle, and when the people exclaimed at what he had done, he came boldly to face the outcry, and asked what harm there had been in him giving them two days as pleasure. Such was Stratocles, and, 
adding flame to fire, Aris Aristophanes says. There was one who, to outdo Stratocles, proposed that it should be decreed that whensoever Demetrius should honour their city with his presence, they should treat him with the same show of hospitable entertainment with which Ceres and Bacchus are received. And the citizen who exceeded the rest in the splendour and costliness of his reception should have a sum of money granted him from the public purse to make a sacred offering. Finally, they changed the name of the month of Munichion and called it Demetrion, and gave the name of the Demetrion to the odd day between the end of the old and the beginning of the new month, and turned the feast of Bacchus, the Dionysia, into the Demetria, or Feast of Demetrius. Most of these changes were marked by the divine displeasure, the sacred robe in which, according to their decree, the figures of Demetrius and Antigonus had been woven with those of Jupiter and Minerva, was caught by a violent gust of wind, while the procession was conveying it through the Caramacus, and was torn from the top to the bottom. A crop of hemlock, a plant which scarcely grew anywhere, even in the country thereabout, sprung up in abundance round the altars which they had erected to these new divinities. They had to omit the solemn procession at the Feast of Bacchus, as upon the very day of its celebration there was such a severe and rigorous frost, coming quite out of its time, that not only the vines and fig trees were killed, but almost all the wheat was destroyed in the blade. Accordingly, Philippides, an enemy to Stratocles, attacked him in a comedy in the following verses. He for whom frosts that nipped your vines were sent, and for whose sins the holy robe was rent, who grants to men the gods' own honours, he, not the poor stage, is now the people's enemy. Philippides was a great favourite with King Lysimachus, from whom the Athenians received, for his sake, a, a variety of kindnesses. Lysimachus went so far as to think it a happy omen to meet or see Philippides at the outset of any enterprise or expedition, and in general he was well thought of for his own character as a plain, uninterfering person, with none of the officious, self-important habits of a court. Once, when Lysimachus was solicitous to show him kindness, and asked what he had that he could make him a present of, anything, replied Philippides, but your state secrets. The stage player, we thought, deserved a place in our narrative quite as well as the public speaker. But that which exceeded all the former follies and flatteries was the proposal of Dromoclides of Sphetus, who, when there was a debate about sending to the Delphic Oracle to inquire the proper course for the consecration of certain bucklers, moved in the assembly that they should rather send to receive an oracle from Demetrius. I will transcribe the very words of the order, which was in these terms, May it be happy and propitious, the people of Athens have decreed that a fit person shall be chosen among the Athenian citizens, who shall be deputed to be sent to the deliverer, and after he hath duly performed the sacrifices, shall inquire of the deliverer in what most religious and decent manner he will please to direct, at the earliest possible time, the consecration of the bucklers, and according to the answer the people shall act. With this be fooling, they completed the perversion of a mind which even before was not so strong or sound as it should have been. During his present leisure in Athens, he took to wife Eurydice, a descendant of the ancient Miltiades, who had been married to Opheltus, the ruler of Cyrene, and after his death had come back to Athens. The Athenians took his marriage as a compliment and favour to the city, but Demetrius was very free in these matters and was the husband of several wives at once, the highest place and honour among all being retained by Phila, who was Antipater's daughter, and had been the wife of Craterus, the one of all the successors of Alexander, who left behind him the strongest feelings of attachment among the Macedonians. And for these reasons Antigonus had obliged him to marry her, notwithstanding the disparity of their years, Demetrius being quite a youth, and she much older, and when upon that account he made some difficulty in complying, Antigonus whispered in his ear the maxim from Euripides, 
broadly substituting a new word for the original serve. Natural or not, a man must wed where profit will be got. Any respect, however, which he showed, either to Fela or to his other wives, did not go so far as to prevent him from consorting with any number of mistresses, and bearing, in this respect, the worst character of all the princes of his time. A summons now arrived from his father, ordering him to go and fight with Ptolemy in Cyprus, which he was obliged to obey, sorry as he was to abandon Greece. And in quitting this nobler and more glorious enterprise, he sent to Cleonides, Ptolemy's general, who was holding garrisons in Sicyon and Corinth, offering him money to let the cities be independent. But, on his refusal, he set sail hastily, taking additional forces with him, and made for Cyprus, where, immediately upon his arrival, he fell upon Menelaus, the brother of Ptolemy, and gave him a defeat. But, when Ptolemy himself came in person, with large forces both on land and sea, for some little time nothing took place beyond an interchange of menaces and lofty talk. Ptolemy bade Demetrius sail off before the whole armament came up, if he did not wish to be trampled underfoot, and Demetrius offered to let him retire, on condition of his withdrawing his garrisons from Sicyon and Corinth. And not they alone, but all the other potentates and princes of the time, were in anxiety for the uncertain impending issue of this conflict, as it seemed evident that the conqueror's prize would be, not Cyprus or Syria, but the absolute supremacy. Ptolemy had brought a hundred and fifty galleys with him, and gave orders to Menelaus to sally, in the heat of the battle, out of the harbour of Salamis, and attack with sixty ships the rear of Demetrius. Demetrius, however, opposing to these sixty, ten of his galleys, which were a sufficient number to block up the narrow entrance of the harbour, and drawing out his land forces along all the headlands running out into the sea, went into action with a hundred and eighty galleys, and, attacking with the utmost boldness and impetuosity, utterly routed Ptolemy, who fled with eight ships, the sole remnant of his fleet, seventy having been taken with all their men, and the rest destroyed in the battle, while the whole multitude of attendants, friends, and women that had followed in the ships of burden, all the arms, treasure, and military engines fell, without exception, into the hands of Demetrius, and were by him collected and brought into the camp. Among the prisoners was the celebrated Lamia, famed at one time for her skill on the flute, and afterwards renowned as a mistress, and although now upon the wane of her youthful beauty, and though Demetrius was much her junior, she exercised over him so great a charm that all other women seemed to be amorous of Demetrius, but Demetrius amorous only of Lamia. After this signal victory, Demetrius came before Salamis, and Menelaus, unable to make any resistance, surrendered himself and all his fleet, twelve hundred horse and twelve thousand foot, together with the place. But that which added more than all to the glory and splendor of the success was the humane and generous conduct of Demetrius to the vanquished. For, after he had given honorable funerals to the dead, he bestowed liberty upon the living, and that he might not forget the Athenians, he sent them as a present complete arms for twelve hundred men. To carry this happy news, Aristodemos of Miletus, the most perfect flatterer belonging to the court, was dispatched to Antigonus, and he, to enhance the welcome message, was resolved, it would appear, to make his most successful effort. When he crossed from Cyprus, he bade the galley which conveyed him come to anchor off the land, and having ordered all the ship's crew to remain aboard, he took the boat, and was set ashore alone. Thus he proceeded to Antigonus, who, one may well imagine, was in suspense enough about the issue and suffered all the anxieties natural to men engaged in so perilous a struggle. And when he heard that Aristodemus was coming alone, it put him into yet greater trouble. He could scarcely forbear from going out to meet him himself. He sent messenger on messenger, and friend after friend, to inquire what news. But Aristodemus, walking gravely and with a settled countenance, 
without making any answer, still proceeded quietly onward, until Antigonus, quite alarmed and no longer able to refrain, got up and met him at the gate, whither he came with a crowd of anxious followers now collected and running after him. As soon as he saw Antigonus within hearing, stretching out his hands, he accosted him with the loud exclamation, Hail, King Antigonus! We have defeated Ptolemy by sea, and have taken Cyprus and 16,800 prisoners. Welcome, Aristodemus, replied Antigonus, but as you choose to torture us so long for your good news, you may wait a while for the reward of it. Upon this the people around gave Antigonus and Demetrius, for the first time, the title of kings. His friends at once set a diadem on the head of Antigonus, and he sent one presently to his son, with a letter addressed to him as King Demetrius. And when this news was told in Egypt, that they might not seem to be dejected with the late defeat, Ptolemy's followers also took occasion to bestow the style of king upon him, and the rest of the successors of Alexander were quick to follow the example. Lysimachus began to wear the diadem, and Seleucus, who had before received the name in all addresses from the barbarians, now also took it upon him in all business with the Greeks. Cassandra still retained his usual superscription in his letters, but others, both in writing and speaking, gave him the royal title. Nor was this the mere accession of a name, or introduction of a new fashion, the men's own sentiments about themselves were disturbed, and their feelings elevated. A spirit of pomp and arrogance passed into their habits of life and conversation, as a tragic actor on the stage modifies, with a change of dress, his step, his voice, his motions in sitting down, his manner in addressing another. The punishments they inflicted were more violent, after they had thus laid aside that modest style under which they formerly dissembled their power, and the influence of which had often made them gentler and less exacting to their subjects. A single pattering voice effected a revolution in the world. Antigonus, extremely elevated with the success of his arms in Cyprus under the conduct of Demetrius, resolved to push on his good fortune and to lead his forces in person against Ptolemy by land, whilst Demetrius should coast with a great fleet along the shore to assist him by sea. The issue of the contest was intimated in a dream which Medeus, a friend to Antigonus, had at this time in his sleep. He thought he saw Antigonus and his whole army running, as if it had been a race, that, in the first part of the course, he went off showing great strength and speed, Gradually, however, his pace slackened, and at the end he saw him come lagging up, tired and almost breathless, and quite spent. Antigonus himself met with many difficulties by land, and Demetrius, encountering a great storm at sea, was driven, with the loss of many of his ships, upon a dangerous coast without a harbour. So the expedition returned without effecting anything. Antigonus, now nearly eighty years old, was no longer well able to go through the fatigues of a marching campaign, though rather on account of his great size and corpulence than from loss of strength. And for this reason he left things to his son, whose fortune and experience appeared sufficient for all undertakings, and whose luxury and expense and revelry gave him no concern. For though in peace he vented himself in his pleasures, when there was nothing to do, ran headlong into any excesses. In war he was as sober and abstemious as the most temperate character. The story is told that once, after Lamia had gained open supremacy over him, the old man, when Demetrius coming home from abroad, began to kiss him with unusual warmth, asked him if he took him for Lamia. At another time, Demetrius, after spending several days in a debauch, excused himself for his absence by saying he had had a violent flux. So I heard, replied Antigonus, was it of Thasian wine or Hian wine? Once he was told his son was ill and went to see him. At the door he met some young beauty. Going in, he sat down by the bed and took his pulse. 
The fever, said Demetrius, has just left me. Oh, yes, replied the father. I met it going out at the door. Demetrius's great actions made Antigonus treat him thus easily. The Scythians, in their drinking bouts, twang their bows to keep their courage awake amidst the dreams of indulgence. But he would resign his whole being, now to pleasure and now to action. And though he never let thoughts of the one intrude upon the pursuit of the other, yet when the time came for preparing for war, he showed as much capacity as any man. And indeed, his ability displayed itself even more in preparing for than in conducting a war. He thought he could never be too well supplied for every possible occasion, and took a pleasure, not to be satiated, in great improvements in shipbuilding and machines. He did not waste his natural genius and power of mechanical research on toys and idle fancies, turning, painting, and playing on the flute, like some kings, Iropus, for example, king of Macedon, who spent his days in making small lamps and tables, or Atalus Philometer, whose amusement was to cultivate poisons, henbane and hellebore, and even hemlock, aconite, and derichnium, which he used to sow himself in the royal gardens, and made it his business to gather the fruits and collect the juices in their season. The Parthian kings took a pride in wetting and sharpening with their own hands the points of their arrows and javelins, but when Demetrius played the workman it was like a king, and there was magnificence in his handicraft. The articles he produced bore marks upon the face of them, not of ingenuity only, but of a great mind and a lofty purpose. They were such as a king might not only design and pay for, but use his own hands to make. And while friends might be terrified with their greatness, enemies could be charmed with their beauty. A phrase which is not so pretty to the ear as it is true to the fact. The very people against whom they were to be employed could not forbear running to gaze with admiration upon his galleys of five and six ranges of oars as they passed along the coasts, and the inhabitants of besieged cities came on their walls to see the spectacle of his famous city-taker siege towers. Even Lysimachus, of all the kings of his time, the greatest enemy of Demetrius. Coming to raise the siege, Osoli in Calicia sent first to desire permission to see his galleys and engines, and having had his curiosity gratified by a view of them, expressed his admiration and quitted the place. The Rhodian, also whom he long besieged, begged him, when they concluded a peace, to let him have some of his engines which they might preserve as a memorial at once of his power and of their own brave resistance. The quarrel between him and the Rhodians was on account of their being allies to Ptolemy, and in the siege the greatest of all the engines was planted against their walls. The base of it was exactly square, each side containing twenty-four cubits. It rose to a height of thirty-three cubits, growing narrower from the base to the top. Within were several apartments or chambers which were to be filled with armed men, and in every story the front towards the enemy had windows for discharging missiles of all sorts, the whole being filled with soldiers for every description of fighting. And what was most wonderful was that, notwithstanding its size, when it was moved it never tottered or inclined to one side, but went forward on its base in perfect equilibrium, with a loud noise and great impetus, astounding the minds, and yet at the same time charming the eyes of all the beholders. Whilst Demetrius was at this same siege, there were brought to him two iron cuirasses from Cyprus, weighing each of them no more than forty pounds. And Zaelus, who had forged them to show the excellence of their temper, desired that one of them might be tried with a catapult missile, shot out of one of the engines at no greater distance than six and twenty paces and upon the experiment it was found that, though the dart exactly hit the cuirass, yet it made no greater impression than such a slight scratch as might be made with the point of a style or graver. Demetrius took this for his own wearing, and gave the other to Alchemus the Epirate, the best soldier and strongest man of all his captains, the only one who used to wear armour to the weight of two talents, one talent being the weight which others thought sufficient. 
He fell during this siege in a battle near the theatre. The Rhodians made a brave defence, insomuch that Demetrius saw he was making but little progress, and only persisted out of obstinacy and passion, and the rather because the Rhodians, having captured a ship in which some clothes and furniture, with letters from herself, were coming to him from Phila his wife, had sent on everything to Ptolemy, and had not copied the honourable example of the Athenians, who, having surprised an express sent from King Philip, their enemy, opened all the letters he was charged with, excepting only those directed to Queen Olympias, which they returned with the seal unbroken. Yet, although greatly provoked, Demetrius, into whose power it shortly after came to repay the affront, would not suffer himself to retaliate. Protogenes, the Caunian, had been making them a painting of the story of Ialysus, which was all but completed, when it was taken by Demetrius in one of the suburbs. The Rhodians sent a herald begging him to be pleased to spare the work and not let it be destroyed. Demetrius's answer to which was that he would rather burn the pictures of his father than a piece of art which had cost so much labour. It is said to have taken Protagonis several years to paint, and they tell us that Apelles, when he first saw it, was struck dumb with wonder, and called it, on recovering his speech, a great labour and a wonderful success, adding, however, that it had not the graces which carried his own paintings as it were up to the heavens. This picture, which came with the rest in the general mass to Rome, there perished by fire. While the Rhodians were thus defending their city to the uttermost, Demetrius, who was not sorry for an excuse to retire, found one in the arrival of ambassadors from Athens, by whose mediation terms were made that the Rhodians should bind themselves to aid Antigonus and Demetrius against all enemies, Ptolemy excepted. The Athenians entreated his help against Cassander, who was besieging the city, so he went thither with a fleet of three hundred and thirty ships, and many soldiers, and not only drove Cassander out of Attica, but pursued him as far as Thermopylae, routed him, and became master of Heraclea, which came over to him voluntarily, and of a body of six thousand Macedonians, which also joined him. Returning hence, he gave their liberty to all the Greeks on this side of Thermopylae, and made alliance with the Boeotians, took Cenchreae, and reduced the fortresses of Phile and Panactum, in which were garrisons of Cassander, restored them to the Athenians. They, in requital, though they had before been so profuse in bestowing honours upon him, that one would have thought they had exhausted all the capacities of invention, showed they had still new refinements of adulation to devise for him. They gave him, as his lodging, the back temple in the Parthenon, and here he lived, under the immediate roof, as they meant it to imply, of his hostess, Minerva, no reputable or well-conducted guest to be quartered upon a maiden goddess. When his brother Philip was once poured into a house where three young women were living, Antigonus, saying nothing to him, sent for his quartermaster, and told him, in the young man's presence, to find some less crowded lodgings for him. Demetrius, however, who should, to say the least, have paid the goddess the respect due to an elder sister, for that was the purport of the city's compliment, filled the temple with such pollutions that the place seemed least profaned when his license confined itself to common women, like Chrysis, Lamia, Demo, or Antikyra. The fair name of the city forbids any further plain particulars. Let us only record the severe virtue of the young Damocles, surnamed, and by that surname pointed out to Demetrius the beautiful, who, to escape importunities, avoided every place of resort, and when at last followed into a private bathing-room by Demetrius, seeing none at hand to help or deliver, seized the lid from the cauldron, and plunging into the boiling water, sought a death untimely and unmerited, but worthy of the country and of the beauty that occasioned it. Not so Clinetus, the son of Cleomedon, who, to obtain from Demetrius a letter of intercession to the people, in behalf of his father, lately condemned in a fine of fifty talents, disgraced himself, 
and got the city into trouble. In deference to the letter, they remitted the fine, yet they made an edict prohibiting any citizen for the future to bring letters from Demetrius. But, being informed that Demetrius resented this as a great indignity, they not only rescinded in alarm the former order, but put some of the proposers and advisers of it to death, and banished others, and furthermore enacted and decreed that whatsoever King Demetrius should in time to come ordain should be accounted right towards the gods and just towards men. And when one of the better class of citizens said Stratocles must be mad to use such words, Demacares of Euconoi observed he would be a fool not to be mad. For Stratocles was well rewarded for his flatteries, and the saying was remembered against Demacares, who was soon after sent into banishment. So fared the Athenians, after being relieved of the foreign garrison, and recovering what was called their liberty. And after this, Demetrius marched with his forces into the Peloponnesus, where he met with none to oppose him, his enemies flying before him, and allowing the cities to join him, he received into friendship all Acte, as it is called, and all Arcadia except Mantinea. He bought the liberty of Argos, Corinth, and Sicyon by paying a hundred talents to their garrisons to evacuate them. At Argos, during the feast of Juno, which happened at the time, he presided at the games, and joining in the festivities with the multitude of the Greeks assembled there, he celebrated his marriage with Deidamia, daughter of Iacades, king of the Molossians, and sister of Pyrrhus. At Sicyon he told the people they had put the city just outside of the city, and, persuading them to remove to where they now live, gave their town not only a new site, but a new name, Demetrius, after himself. A general assembly met on the Isthmus, where he was proclaimed, by a great concourse of people, the commander of Greece, like Philip and Alexander of old, whose superior he, in the present height of his prosperity and power, was willing enough to consider himself, and certainly, in one respect, he outdid Alexander, who never refused their title to other kings, or took on himself the style of king of kings, though many kings received both their title and their authority as such from him, whereas Demetrius used to ridicule those who gave the name of king to any except himself and his father, and in his entertainments was well pleased when his followers, after drinking to him and his father as kings, went on to drink the health of Seleucus, with the title of Master of the Elephants, of Ptolemy by the name of High Admiral, of Lysimachus with the addition of Treasurer, and of Agathocles with the style of Governor of the Island of Sicily. The other kings merely laughed when they were told of this vanity. Lysimachus alone expressed some indignation at being considered a eunuch, such being usually then selected for the office of treasurer, and in general there was a more bitter enmity between him and Lysimachus than with any of the others. Once, as a scoff at his passion for Lamia, Lysimachus said he had never before seen a courtesan act a queen's part, to which Demetrius rejoined that his mistress was quite as honest as Lysimachus's own Penelope. But to proceed, Demetrius being about to return to Athens, signified by letter to the city that he desired immediate admission to the rites of initiation into the mysteries, and wished to go through all the stages of the ceremony, from first to last, without delay. This was absolutely contrary to the rules, and a thing which had never been allowed before, for the lesser mysteries were celebrated in the month of Anthesterion, and the great solemnity in Boidromion, and none of the novices were finally admitted till they had completed a year after this latter. Yet, all this notwithstanding, when in the public assembly these letters of Demetrius were produced and read, there was not one single person who had the courage to oppose them, except Pythodorus, the torch-bearer. But it signified nothing, for Stratocles at once proposed that the month of Munichion, then current, should by edict be reputed to be the month of Anthesterion, which being voted and done, and Demetrius thereby admitted to the lesser ceremonies, by another vote they turned the same month of Munichion 
into the other month of Boydromion. The celebration of the greater mysteries ensued, and Demetrius was fully admitted. These proceedings gave the comedian, Philippides, a new occasion to exercise his wit upon Stratocles, whose fluttering fear into one month hath crowded all the year, and on the vote that Demetrius should lodge in the Parthenon, who turns the temple to a common inn, and makes the virgin's house a house of sin. Of all the disreputable and flagitious acts of which he was guilty in this visit, one that particularly hurt the feelings of the Athenians was that, having given comment that they should forthwith raise for his service two hundred and fifty talents, and they to comply with his demands being forced to levy it upon the people with the utmost rigour and severity, when they presented him with the money which they had with such difficulty raised, as if it were a trifling sum, he ordered it to be given to Lamia and the rest of his women to buy soap. The loss, which was bad enough, was less galling than the shame, and the words more intolerable than the act which they accompanied. Though indeed the story is variously reported, and some say it was the Thessalians and not the Athenians who were thus treated, Lamia, however, exacted contributions herself to pay for an entertainment she gave to the king, and her banquet was so renowned for its sumptuosity that a description of it was drawn up by the Samian writer Lincius. Upon this occasion, one of the comic writers gave Lamia the name of the real Helepolis, city-taker, and Demacharis of Soli called Demetrius Mythos, because the fable always had its Lamia, and so had he. And in truth, his passion for this woman, and the prosperity in which she lived, were such as to draw upon him not only the envy and jealousy of all his wives, but the animosity even of his friends. For example, on Lysimachus's showing to some ambassadors from Demetrius the scars of the wounds which he had received upon his thighs and arms by the paw of the lion with which Alexander had shut him up, after hearing his account of the combat, they smiled and answered that their king also was not without his scars, but could show upon his neck the marks of a lamia a no less dangerous beast. It was also matter of wonder that, though he had objected so much to Phila on account of her age, he was as yet such a slave to Lamia, who was so long past her prime. One evening at supper, when she played the flute, Demetrius asked Demo, whom the men called Madness, what she thought of her. Demo answered she thought her an old woman, and when a quantity of sweetmeats were brought in, and the king said again, See what presents I get from Lamia? My old mother, answered Demo, I will send you more, if you will make her your mistress. Another story is told of a criticism passed by Lamia, or the famous judgment of Book Chorus. A young Egyptian had made suit to Thonis, the courtesan, offering a sum of gold for her favour, but before it came to pass, he dreamed one night that he had obtained it, and satisfied with the shadow, felt no more desire for the substance. Thonis upon this brought an action for the sum. Bochorus, the judge, on hearing the case, ordered the defendant to bring into court the full amount in a vessel, which he was to move to and fro in his hand, and the shadow of it was to be adjudged to Thonis. The fairness of this sentence Lamia contested, saying the young man's desire might have been satisfied with the dream, but Thornus's desire for the money could not be relieved by the shadow. Thus much for Lamia, and now the story passes from the comic to the tragic stage, in pursuit of the acts and fortunes of its subject. A general league of the kings, who were now gathering and combining their forces to attack Antigonus, recalled Demetrius from Greece. He was encouraged by finding his father full of a spirit and resolution for the combat that belied his years. Yet it would seem to be true, that if Antigonus could only have borne to make some trifling concessions, and if he had shown any moderation in his passion for empire, he might have maintained for himself till his death, and left to his son behind him the first place among the kings. But he was of a violent and haughty spirit, and the insulting words as well as actions in which he allowed himself could not be borne by young and powerful princes and provoked them into combining against him, though now when he was told of the confederacy he could not forbear from saying that this 
flock of birds would soon be scattered by one stone and a single shout. He took the field at the head of more than 70,000 foot and 10,000 horse and 75 elephants. His enemies had 64,000 foot, 500 more horse than he, elephants to the number of 400 and 120 chariots. On their near approach to each other, an alteration began to be observable, not in the purposes, but in the presentiments of Antigonus. For whereas in all former campaigns he had ever shown himself lofty and confident, loud in voice and scornful in speech, often by some joke or mockery on the eve of battle, expressing his contempt and displaying his composure, he was now remarked to be thoughtful, silent, and retired. He presented Demetrius to the army, and declared him his successor, and what every one thought stranger than all, was that he now conferred alone in his tent with Demetrius, whereas in former time he had never entered into any secret consultations even with him, but had always followed his own advice, made his resolutions, and then given out his commands. Once when Demetrius was a boy, and asked him how soon the army would move, he is said to have answered him sharply, Are you afraid, lest you, of all the army, should not hear the trumpet? There were now, however, inauspicious signs which affected his spirits. Demetrius, in a dream, had seen Alexander, completely armed, appear and demand of him what word they intended to give in the time of the battle, and Demetrius answered that he intended the password should be Jupiter and victory. Then, said Alexander, I will go to your adversaries and find my welcome with them. And on the morning of the combat, as the armies were drawing up, Antigonus, going out of the door of his tent, by some accident or other, stumbled and fell flat upon the ground, hurting himself a good deal. And on recovering his feet, lifting up his hands to heaven, he prayed the gods to grant him either victory or death without knowledge of defeat. When the armies engaged, Demetrius, who commanded the greatest and best part of the cavalry, made a charge on Antiochus, the son of Seleucus, and gloriously routing the enemy, followed the pursuit, in the pride and exultation of success, so eagerly and so unwisely far, that it fatally lost him the day. For when, perceiving his error, he would have come in to the assistance of his own infantry, he was not able, the enemy with their elephants having cut off his retreat. And on the other hand, Seleucus, observing the main battle of Antigonus left naked of their horse, did not charge, but made a show of charging, and keeping them in alarm, and wheeling about, and still threatening an attack, he gave opportunity for those who wished it to separate and come over to him, which a large body of them did, the rest taking to flight. But the old king Antigonus still kept his post, and when a strong body of the enemies drew up to charge him, and one of those about him cried out to him, Sir, they are coming upon you, he only replied, What else should they do? But Demetrius will come to my rescue. And in this hope he persisted to the last, looking out on every side for his son's approach, until he was borne down by a whole multitude of darts, and fell dead. His other followers and friends fled, and Thorax of Larissa remained alone by the body. The battle having been thus decided, the kings who had gained the victory, carving up the whole vast empire that had belonged to Demetrius and Antigonus like a carcass into so many portions, added these new gains to their former possessions. As for Demetrius, with five thousand foot and four thousand horse, he fled at his utmost speed to Ephesus, where it was the common opinion he would seize the treasures of the temple to relieve his wants. But he, on the contrary, fearing such an attempt on the part of his soldiers, hastened away and sailed for Greece, his chief remaining hopes being placed in the fidelity of the Athenians, with whom he had left part of his navy, and of his treasure, and his wife, Daedamia. And in their attachment he had not the least doubt, but he should, in this his extremity, find a safe resource. Accordingly, when, upon reaching the Cuclades, he was met by ambassadors from Athens, requesting him not to proceed to the city, as the people had passed a vote to admit no king whatever within their walls, 
and had conveyed Daedamia with honourable attendance to Megara. His anger and surprise overpowered him, and the constancy quite failed him, which he had hitherto shown in a wonderful degree under his reverses, nothing humiliating or mean-spirited having as yet been seen in him under all his misfortunes. But to be thus disappointed in the Athenians, and to find the friendship he had trusted, prove upon trial, thus empty and unreal, was a great pang to him. And in truth, an excessive display of outward honour would seem to be the most uncertain attestation of the real affection of a people for any king or potentate. Such shows lose their whole credit as tokens of affection, which has its virtue in the feelings and moral choice, when we reflect that they may equally proceed from fear. The same decrees are voted upon the latter motive as upon the former, and therefore judicious men do not look so much to statues, paintings, or divine honours that are paid them, as to their own actions and conduct, judging hence whether they shall trust these as a genuine, or discredit them as a forced homage, as in fact nothing is less unusual than for a people, even while offering compliments, to be disgusted with those who accept them greedily, or arrogantly, or without respect to the free will of the givers. Demetrius, shamefully used as he thought himself, was in no condition to revenge the affront. He returned a message of gentle expostulation, saying, however, that he expected to have his galleys sent to him, among which was that of thirteen banks of oars, and this being accorded him, he sailed to the Isthmus, and finding his affairs in very ill condition, his garrisons expelled, and a general secession going on to the enemy, he left Pyrrhus to attend to Greece, and took his course to the Chersonesus, where he ravaged the territories of Lysimachus, and by the booty which he took, maintained and kept together his troops, which were now once more beginning to recover, and to show some considerable front. Nor did any of the other princes care to meddle with him on that side, for Lysimachus had quite as little claim to be loved, and was more to be feared for his power. But, not long after, Seleucus sent to treat with Demetrius for a marriage between himself and Stratonike, daughter of Demetrius by Phila.